Good evening, everyone. Welcome and happy International Women's Day. My name is Marina Isgro, and I'm Associate Curator of Media and Performance Art at the Hirshhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden. Thank you so much for joining us for tonight's event, Oh Superwomen, an artist talk with Radha Akbar and Lori Anderson. My name is Marina Isgro, and I am Associate Curator of Media and Performance Art, or sorry, I just said that. Card captioning and uh, American Sign Language interpretation are provided for tonight's program. You can find more information about both of those options in the chat. So tonight our conversation will run for about 40 or 45 minutes, and then we will open it up to audience Q&A. Um, but you can submit a question at any time during the program by hitting the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And now I am honored to introduce our speakers. Radha Akbar is an activist and artist born and raised in Afghanistan who uses her art to speak out against misogyny and oppression. Her work, which includes wearable monuments, performance, photography, and installations, has been displayed in numerous national and international exhibitions. In 2015, she received an honorable mention in the UNICEF Photo of the Year Award. In 2020, her exhibition called Abarzanan or Superwomen, which celebrates pioneering Afghan women, was featured in the New York Times. In 2021, she received the Prince Klaus Seed Award and a Muher Oy Award, and was featured in the BBC's 100 Women list. She will be joining us tonight from Paris, where she is currently in exile. And Lori, I'll keep your introduction a bit shorter since we've done a few of these events now. Uh, Lori Anderson is a Grammy award-winning musician, performer, writer, and artist whose exhibition, The Weather, is currently on view at the Hirshhorn through July. One of the leading multimedia artists of our time, she recently delivered the Charles Eliot Norton lectures at Harvard University. This program is one of several talks and performances we'll be hosting with Lori this season. Uh, please visit our website to view the full list and we'll also put a link to that in the chat. So we're gathered tonight with these two exciting speakers on the occasion of International Women's Day. Radha and Lori are currently collaborating on a project called a Fashion Show for Spirits. And we'll hear a little bit about that work in progress toward the end of our talk. We will also explore issues of women, feminism, and power in contemporary art through Akbar's ongoing project, Abarzanan, which I've mentioned, and Anderson's early photographic projects that are currently on view at the Hirshhorn. So Radha and Lori, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, Radha, please turn on your camera and Lori will be joining us in a few minutes. Hi, welcome. Hello, good afternoon. Happy International Women's Day. Yeah, and thank you for being here. I know it's about 11 p.m. your time, so we really appreciate your staying awake for this. <laughs> well, it's an incredible honor for me to be uh, on this talk with you and uh, Brilliant uh, Lori. Yeah. So um, we thought you could start by introducing the Abarzanan project for us, and then we'll show um, about a three minute video of an installation of the work from 2020. So why don't you just describe it for us first? Uh, Abarzanan is a yearly um, annual exhibition uh, to pay homage to Afghan and uh, international uh, women's strength and uh, resilience. Uh, I started this project in 2018 and the first uh, um, exhibition was launched on the International Women's Day in 2019. Um, so through these exhibitions, I um, would create uh, wearable monuments, uh, paintings and installation pieces in collaborations with Afghan and international artists and uh, artisans to honor each woman's uh, contribution to the history. Uh, I started the project by selecting eight women, four historical figures and four contemporary women. And uh, I wanted that each piece uh, carry a story of Afghan heritage and um, female strength. All right, great. Okay, so let's take a look at the video and then we can discuss some specific examples in more detail. This is about three minutes long.
Thank you for sharing that. It's a really stunning installation, really beautiful. Um, I'm wondering if you can actually walk us through a couple of the figures that we saw in more detail. Tell me a little bit about who they represent, how you chose to represent them and so on. Uh, um, I would like to talk about uh, maybe two um, you know, yeah. uh, figures that have been featured in the first and second uh, rounds of the exhibitions. Uh, when I started uh, the project, the first woman that I started with was the Queen Gauhar Shod Begum, uh, an empress of uh, Timurid dynasty, late 15th and early 16th century. Um, she became the anchor of the whole project. Um, she moved the capital of the dynasty from uh, Samarkand to Herat, and she led a cultural renaissance um, that uh, elevated uh, Persian language and uh, culture. Uh, by patronizing uh, so many artists, um, uh, philosophers, architects, uh, musicians, and uh, poets. Um, she was also integral in changing uh, the empire's uh, architecture. Uh, the world renowned uh, Gav Harshad Mosque in present day Iran and Gav Harshad Madrasa and Musilium in Herat are just two of so many historical sites that were built under her. Uh, guidance and uh, vision. She was also a very skilled uh, politician, but despite her um, um, wisdom and experience, she was blocked from uh, ruling directly after her husband died. So she managed to install her favorite grandson as a puppet king um, to rule the kingdom for, uh, kingdom for more than uh, 10 years. To me, she was the right person uh, around whom I could orient the, um, the whole series because um, she uh, demonstrated the powerful contribution that women are capable to um, capable of making to Afghan culture, even if they are uh, not given the permission to do so. Another piece um, was dedicated to a woman named uh, Rokhshana. Uh, Rokhshana is known as a 19 years old woman that was kidnapped and uh, stoned uh, by the Taliban in October 2015. When she was only 10 years old, uh, she was um, her father decided to marry her off to a um, much older man, but she refused uh, to accept her family's decisions. Um, so she eloped with a boy her age, uh, but she was arrested by um, local um, security officials and um, she was arrested and handed back um, to her family. Years passed and she um, faced violence and threats. And when she was 19 years old, her father decided to marry her off again to an older man. And she again ran away with a man uh, that she was in love with. But this time she was captured by a Taliban commander. And uh, at first they uh, demanded for a ransom from her family. And after the family failed to pay, they ordered her stoning for adultery. And they called her father to attend the public uh, execution. I wanted to uh, dedicate a piece to her by honoring her um, dreams uh, and um, memory and wishes, but also to recognize the rebellious, the resilient, and the uh, free spirit that draw her to running from uh, uh, forced marriages, not once, but twice, um, even at the cost of death. Wow, those are both incredible stories. Um, we have a short video of Roxana that we will show now. I think it's about 30 seconds long, just so you can get a sense of the all the dimensions of the work.
Beautiful, thank you. And I just want to say hello to Lori Anderson, who has just joined us. Hi, Lori. Yes, hi. Very <laughs> tired uh, uh, to be a little bit late, but um, it's so great to be here. Hi, Radha. How are you? Hi, Lori. Good to see you. Hey, hi, everyone. So we've just looked at uh, two of the women that Radha chose to highlight in Abars and On. Um, so I want to ask you a few questions about the project as a whole. Um, it seems to me that the work is largely about visibility. So the power of art to restore or bring women into the public view, you know, visualizing some kind of community or history. Is that kind of the way you think about the, the project? Uh, yeah, that is exactly the, the goal of Abar Zanon because um, I have always been inspired by women and uh, uh, by women that I know and uh, women who remained unrecognized because I always see myself being carried by the spirits of women who lived before me. And uh, I always feel that I owe my freedom and my rights to them because they fight, they fought and they sacrificed and risked their lives. So we can have a better life. We can enjoy the, you know, the right and freedom that we have today. Um, so this is the truth that women have been denied power and erased from the history books, not just in Afghanistan, but all over the world. They have been, they have remained hidden. And it's been just in recent decades that, you know, um, they are being celebrated and unearthed um, and uh, appreciated. Um, so yeah, this is exactly what, uh, you know, I wanted to do with, uh, with this project. Yeah, but to me, what's so interesting about it is that you know, there's this idea of portraiture and representation, but you're not actually showing physical features of the women's faces. So I'm wondering how you made that decision and how you chose to kind of represent their specificity or their uniqueness instead. Well, uh, as an artist, I always, uh, you know, uh, like and enjoy to try um, new ways and dimensions in art. And also, you know, trying new, you know, doing more kind of like experiments, how I can find a new tool to transform my thoughts and ideas. And uh, with this project, um, um, the thing is that I have a lot of freedom and I uh, have so many plans for this. You know, I was thinking to um, have a storybooks of these women, you know, for, for children. Uh, in Afghanistan and outside of Afghanistan. So children start, you know, learning about these um, historical figures or these uh, powerful women that they have been and are contributing to our shared world, to our shared uh, history. Um, so, um, yeah, in this project, it's, it's, uh, it's quite unique that I played more, you know, uh, with fashion as a tool to uh, share their stories. Um, but also, you know, had these other ideas of like, you know, doing podcasts, doing animations, doing storybooks and um, yeah. Yeah, and you were also planning a women's history museum in Afghanistan, is that right, before you left? Uh, yes, uh, I um, started working on that uh, before I launched the second round of uh, Barzanon exhibition. And uh, I managed to secure a space in a um, recently renovated uh, palace in Kabul, um, where I was keeping my art pieces. Um, where you know I was storing them, and I had the last exhibition, last you know um, displayed there last year. Um, but uh, unfortunately, now uh, I'm in exile. But uh, this is not what you know uh, I'm going to give up on. Um, so I have already been thinking about it to maybe start it as a museum in exile or an online museum. And uh, one day, uh, hopefully I will have the, you know, or we will have the physical museum somewhere. Yeah, absolutely. I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about your process in creating these works. I know that you work with artisans um, to actually construct some of the, the dresses and the installation pieces. Could you talk about that? Well, uh, one of the most enjoyable parts of this project was when I, uh, you know, when this project would lead me to new artists and artisans, because every and each artist would inspire me in a very unique way. And uh, the way we would exchange ideas and uh, the way we would work together was really enriching for me. But uh, I would 
get a very uh, um, a special uh, inspiration from uh, female artisans because I would deal with them um, um, sometimes on daily basis. And uh, I, you know, seeing their uh, small acts of rebellion every day would really inspire and encourage me to move ahead. Um, even they wouldn't recognize that, you know, uh, contribution that they were, you know, doing to the society. These women who have been denied education, who have been denied uh, their rights and freedom, but they would dare to dream. They would dare to dream for the, their daughters to have a better life, to send them to school, to, you know, to encourage them and support them to go out to work, to even, you know, let them to choose their own attire. I would always see that how supportive these women were for their daughters. And um, that was a very, you know, unique inspiration that I would um, get from them. And uh, to me, they were um, the super women. Thank you. So, Lori, I wanted to ask you kind of what drew you to Rada's work? What got you interested in her work and what do you find unique or distinctive about it? Well, I, I um, uh, was really impressed with what, also what you were just saying, Rada, about how you were working with um, uh, a number of, of people to develop these things. And I, and I really admire that. Um, impulse and, and it reminded me a little bit of, of a project of a friend of mine, Tina Gerard, who was uh, um, making a lot of beautiful sequin art. And she worked with a lot of women in Haiti and who did sequin things and made sequin hats. And she, she um, collaborated with them to make her sequin paintings. And then what I found really incredible about her was where she was talking about um, the factory, hat factory that they had in Haiti. And she was saying, uh, how much do women make there at that factory? And, and they were like, nothing. And, and so she found a way for them to buy the hat factory and own it and make these works that they began then to design. So I thought, what an amazing way for uh, women to work with other women and and uh, collaborate with people who are not necessarily doing artwork, but definitely collaborating with them. So I, 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 that aspect uh, of it was um, really interesting to, to me that, that you would um, um, tell me a little bit more about the the your your collaborators, the people who made these. These, are they people who are, are seamstresses or are they, are they other artists or who, who are they? Uh, they call themselves like very ordinary people, you know, and uh, they just, uh, for instance, one of the women that I have been working for the past, uh, you know, since I started this uh, project for, you know, uh, three years, she has been doing embroidery for, um, more than 30 years. So she was a master in her um, work and she was the mother of uh, four girls and uh, one son. Um, she, um, she lived as a refugee um, two times and uh, she was denied education. She, you know, she, she didn't have the chance to get any education and she lived most of her life in poverty. But all her children were educated because you know, she believed in education and she was, uh, she was a breadwinner, you know, through her work, um, work and art, but she wouldn't even consider herself as, uh, as an artist. Um, and she was, you know, the woman that I would share the stories, you know, of these women that we would feature in the exhibition and we would have discussions. And it was just so enjoyable for me to share all these, you know, stories, uh, with her and, uh, you know, uh, just hearing back uh, what, what she says. And then she started coming up with uh, ideas, you know, she started thinking about um, directing her work from just, you know, getting orders from people and, you know, making uh, pieces of um, embroidery. Then she told me that she wants to use her work to make portraits of women, you know, just, you know, this was her own idea. This is what she wanted to do. But uh, yeah, to me, it was uh, 
the, the most inspiring thing was that, you know, she was a very strong woman, that she was uh, um, supporting her own family, her children, and uh, all her daughters were, uh, you know, uh, graduated from university, they were working, and uh, it was just because of her, because she was, uh, you know, she had this power, and uh, this determined, you know, she was very determined, and um, um, yeah, this yeah. is just one of the, you know, one of the women that I, uh, I would work with. Right. And Laura, your practice is so collaborative too. So I see that connection between you. Um, I know we wanted to kind of weave in a little bit of Lori's work into this conversation as well. So maybe we can take a quick look at um, one photo series that's on view at the Hirshhorn right now called Object Objection Objectivity, Fully Automated Nikon from 1973. So this is pretty different from Radha's work in that Lori is not actually picturing or representing women here, but is representing men. Um, Lori, you, you created this work as a young woman in your 20s living in New York. Maybe you can take us back to that time and tell us about some of the gender issues you were negotiating here. Well, and this is, um, I was living on the uh, <clears throat> Lower East Side and um, there was, a, a you know, a, much um, more active street life <laughs> at that point than than now, and people uh, talk to each other more. Um, uh, men catcalled women more than they do now. Now they're, <laughs> they're not really allowed to do that. And that I found, um, like I, I I began to uh, think of of the camera as a as a way that I could. Um, protect myself and um and also so when when I would get cat called I would just say can I take a picture and I thought that it would be sort of a way of mm, not shaming people but just sort of like calling them out on on what kind of jerks they were being just and no in fact they were super flattered they were like my picture really oh I'd please go ahead and so it it was, it kind of backfired on me a little bit, you know, and I just, I just realized it, it was more about how much people love to have their picture taken and love to be uh, looked at. So uh, it, it was a, a, not so much a comment on uh, men leering at women as, as the, as, as all our own vanity that we, you know, just, uh, just enjoy that. So and then this this um, um, eye cover is something that occurred, you know. Um, well, it occurs often in in uh, in uh, photography that has to do with sexual relations. That that um, and uh, in pornography as well, and other things. And so, <clears throat> and it also came back in the in the nineties. We I, I'm just realizing we use the same kind of masking when we. Uh, when we, in other words, a, a large group of artists formed a group called Women's Action Coalition, and this was uh, a group formed around um, uh, formed around um, the Anita Hill uh, case, Clarence Thomas hearings in the Supreme Court, and uh, when she testified, uh, uh, she was disguised by a a, a blue dot and so we we made a lot of masks for well for, for our um some of our events that that um um blotted out our face with this electronic blue dot that would just kind of hover in front of her face as she was testifying it was it was really ridiculous um but it um it was uh it it became a very iconic uh thing about looking and being looked at yeah, absolutely. Uh, were you reading sort of feminist theory at the time, or how were you kind of absorbing these ideas about the gaze and objectification? I didn't really need to read feminist theory. Oh, I yeah. just did feminist theory. <laughs> did <laughs> feminist things. And Fair enough. <laughs> I read some of the things about it, but I, it was very active moment for that. Right. And, uh, and there was a lot of... Um, uh, a, a lot of political activity. I remember one one um, <laughs> incident in which um, 
we were, this was around the time of the Iraq war also. And it was the Bush elder was uh, campaigning on a, on this, with this slogan, uh, read my lips, no new taxes. And, and so we, we were doing a lot of demonstrations then. And we, we had a lot of, uh, we were trying to figure out uh, ways to call attention to this, uh, to uh, a number of women's issues. And so one idea was that we would all go topless to this, um, yeah, it was a Times Square somewhere, topless and right on our bodies, read my tits, no, no, something. Anyway, it was supposed to be a play on George Bush. Now, one of the members uh, was uh, an Iranian artist and, and she, um, uh, and we're having this big debate about, oh, this is great, a great slogan. And, and she, she goes, uh, you know, I don't think it's a good idea to use our bodies as billboards really. And we were all like, oh God, you know, we were kind of, uh, um, quite ashamed that we, we thought that was such a great idea. But anyway, I, I, um, at that time, there was a lot of, um, uh, a lot of activity in, uh, uh, it was sort of the, maybe the third wave of feminist activity, especially yeah. in terms of, of artists. And, and I haven't, um, I've been waiting for the next wave. <laughs> so <laughs> when I saw Rada's work, I was like, well, this is a really wonderful development on this, which is, is, is um, looking at, at history and, and, um, and it was a very, it's a very positive spin on, on this. Uh, it's not, um, I don't know. I, I just don't find um, there's a, a lot going on in, in um, uh, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe we can, we can pull the audience and see if they have a different um, view of, of what's going on in terms of, of, of women's actions now these days. Yeah, I'd love to hear if anyone has thoughts about that in the chat. But I also love, Lori, how you pointed to kind of the differences in these feminist conversations in the U.S. versus, you know, in the Middle East and globally. And I wonder if maybe both of you could talk about kind of uh, creating feminist art or art about women's issues. How do you how do you do that without being just didactic? Um, I don't know. What do you what do you think about that? Do you think of the, that as what you're doing, Radha? I, I, I don't think of that as what you're doing somehow. Uh, well, um, in my work, uh, I have always, always focused on women's issues because I'm a woman and, you know, I was living in a society, in a very conservative, patriarchal society. And um, my art has been a reflection of, you know, my surroundings you know, the realities around me. So I think that is why I chosen to focus on women's issues and um, just, you know, once in a while, just thinking about to make or find a new tool to just, you know, transform my new ideas and thoughts about, you know, the, the, um, the issues or the obstacles that uh, women have been facing um, in my country, um, including me, you know, as a, woman um, and I have always enjoyed you know working uh, on this topic um, because uh, I am a feminist myself I believe in equality I believe in women's rights and uh, I also see it as a responsibility um, I think that is why I just want to keep my focus on this topic because um, as I said you know um, earlier I I see myself, you know, being carried with the spirits of women who lived before me. So I, I see that this is my responsibility to keep their path, you know, um, uh, to keep their fight on. And uh, because I think this is an endless fight. We cannot <laughs> yeah. take freedom and rights for granted. We have to keep, you know, uh, keep our fight because we are living in a patriarchal, uh, you know, uh, world. And uh, um, I see that uh, 
you know, we have a very, very long way to equality or, you know, to uh, free world uh, where women would enjoy their full human rights. So, yeah, I think just this uh, sense of responsibility always pushes me to focus on this topic and um, just, you know, um, and this is what I really truly enjoy doing, you know, dedicating my creativity and time and uh, energy um, doing this. Um, yeah. Yeah. How about you, Laura? You don't identify as a feminist artist. No, I do. I, mm -hmm. I, uh, but I, when I think of, of the, the work that, um, that you do, Radha, I, I think of it as deeply human. I don't think of it as feminist necessarily, just because, mm -hmm. because we're the majority of human beings. So I'm, I, I see it as certainly as, as, as justice and, and, and uh, as, a, as dealing with justice, for sure. That, that's absolutely for sure, and um, I, and I do think that uh, there are are certain um, uh, values attached to uh, feminism that are that are that are different than um, than maybe strictly human values. I have to say, although that's a kind of crazier conversation. But uh, in terms of equality, sometimes I do worry that. Um, especially in the U.S., that we're kind of backsliding. We have a, a number of things on on the books that we're losing these days <laughs> in terms of rights for women. And uh, there uh, are, uh, I guess it was Ruth Bader Ginsburg who said, you know, somebody said, when when will there be enough women on the Supreme Court? And she said, when all of them are women. And I was like, right on. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> That's a really nice answer. Uh, for a while, why not? To balance it, um, I I do see women as more peaceful and uh, and more willing to uh, uh, generally uh, negotiate. <laughs> I think we're really good negotiators. Uh, I think we're really good negotiators. It's one of the the skills that we have. So. Um, uh, and I, whenever I hear things about how women are too emotional to do certain things, I'm, I'm, I just look at, at the kind of emotional uh, um, temper tantrums that are going on now in, in men oh, yeah. that are creating an extremely dangerous world. These are emotional temper tantrums. And so... I, I, I don't quite get how women would be just too emotional to be in charge. It's so true. It's like anger and aggression are not categorized as emotions, right? Out of control emotions. Out yeah. Control. yeah. Um, Lori, I know when we were preparing for this talk, you had some thoughts about kind of the visibility of Ukrainian women over the past couple of weeks. Um, you know, we've seen these pretty horrible images of you know, women giving birth in, in bomb shelters and, and fleeing and uh, entering these refugee convoys and so on. So I wonder if you could um, just share a little bit about what you're thinking about that right now. I guess my, one of my concerns was um, uh, the surrogates because uh, uh, there are, it's the uh, country that has the most uh, going on in terms of the surrogate industry, and and, and it is an industry of people, uh, women, young women, uh, and with all of the corridors shutting down now, who knows where these young mm -hmm. pregnant women are going? So, I think uh, it's it's a really good moment to think of of how women can help other women in this situation and focus on, on that specifically, for example. Yeah. Um, I, I don't, uh, I can't get a handle on, on really what's going on there more than any, you know, I, I, can you, I mean, it's, it just seems. No, it's awful. Um, I mean, yeah. It's like the news is just all consuming right now. Um, okay, maybe we should shift a little bit and talk about your collaboration, Lori and Rada. 
Um, so Rada, maybe you can tell us kind of about how you initially connected and, and decided to collaborate. Uh, it was 10th of October when I uh, met Lori for the first time. Um, I was preparing for a show. I was um, about to be part of a show which uh, was happening in November last year. And uh, I was invited by the curator of the show. And uh, she was, uh, and when I was on the way uh, to her place, she told me that Sophie Kahl and uh, Laurie Anderson uh, will join us for a drink. And um, so I went there and uh, uh, Sophie and Laurie showed up. We had a glass of drink and uh, we chatted, I think about uh, one hour or less than an hour. And uh, there Laurie asked me to show her my work and uh, yeah, she, um, she, yeah, she was very supportive of my work and she said, uh, let's do a collaboration. And um, that is how we, we got connected. And then, uh, yeah, we started exchanging emails and thoughts and ideas and uh, Zoom calls and uh, yeah. Great, and Lori, maybe you wanna tell us a little bit about fashion show for spirits. I know this is very much a work in progress no, in very no. early stages. I mean, uh, <laughs> We're having a lot of fun um, between us now uh, devising this thing. But, you know, I, I have almost a jinx-like feeling when I'm working on something uh, to describe it too much. You know, so uh, let's say it would have, uh, hopefully it will be um, a use some, some fashion tropes and some uh, things that in, uh, would push those uh, I ideas in interesting ways. I mean, I um, we come from uh, a slightly different worlds of, of of rather from this um, making these beautiful things, and 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 I'm I like to activate them along some other pathways. So we've been talking about how that might look, and I just find that so incredibly exciting and. Um, and it's uh, it's also you know a chance to um, I, uh, I like you Rada I think I I, I do things with um, uh, with fabricators and people who realize things but not so much things with someone who goes what should we do like from the very beginning so uh, that uh, uh, as as we go beyond the original ideas that we were thinking about, uh, it, it opens up a whole new world of, of where it could go. And, and I'm hoping to, um, uh, there are a couple other collaborators I think we, could, we might want to um, uh, bring into this crazy project, <laughs> but I, you know, I think it's, it's um, uh, I got so inspired by seeing the way you were using your work to tell stories and this is um something i'm very interested in as well and and how do you tell them in a in a in a way that is um is very immediate and yet specific because these are not two sentence stories they're longer ones so how do you um that's always a a, a question in in visual art uh, uh to how do you incorporate narrative in that so um Anytime you try to uh, make something time-based, it, it becomes a question of, of uh, you know, you, you need to have visual impact, but then you also need to have the time that it takes for your stories in particular to unfurl because they're complicated ones and they're not things that you can just see at a punch. So, so how do you develop that? So that that's really... Um, interesting to me as uh, to, to be able to uh, maybe, um, you know, uh, have a, a, a role in, in helping to see how that vision could, you know, go different places. And um, Yeah, I love that comment about storytelling. That actually makes me wonder, Rada, if you show kind of text alongside the, the dresses or the monuments, how do you, how do you identify the women sort of next to those uh, visual representations? Uh, sorry, I didn't get it. Uh, yeah, no, it, do, you, do you display, for example, little 
texts biographies or mean? stories? Yeah, biographies. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, at the exhibition, uh, we would uh, have the biographies in two languages, you know, English and right. uh, language. So people would come and first they would read the biographies. And then I would explain, uh, you know, if they would come to me to, you know, with their questions, then I would explain to, to them that why I, you know, uh, selected certain elements or patterns for, for this piece. And, uh, uh, but yeah, definitely we needed to have uh, their bios. Uh, so people yeah. could learn, that, uh, learn yeah. about their stories. Absolutely. It just reminds me of Lori's work in that normally, Lori, when you have these photographs, there is some kind of textual element to the side telling the story, you know, or, or anchoring the photo in some way. Mm -hmm. um, we have a lot of questions from viewers, so I think we should dive into those. Um, so Amy, I'm wondering if we can go back to the images of, of Rada's monuments from the beginning, because one of the questions is about the inspiration <laughs> behind some of the other uh, mannequins or, or works. And the one that I was most curious about was the, the one in black with the hands on the mm -hmm. body. Maybe you could talk about that one a little bit. Uh, yeah, this piece was dedicated to a woman uh, named Khaleda um, Popalzai. Uh, she was the captain of uh, female footballers. And uh, she was uh, the first woman who um, spoken out against the harassment that the uh, you know, female players uh, were facing. Um, and uh, she has received a lot of backlashes uh, for mm -hmm. speaking, you know, about this harassment because the guy that she was accusing of, you know, harassing the women was very powerful. And uh, um, she, she received threats. She received a lot of backlashes for speaking publicly about it. So I dedicated this piece to her because it was like one part was her own uh, story but also the story of like the society. So to me, uh, there are like three main factors that suppress women in the society. It's religion, it's economy, and it's um, uh, politics. So each hand represents one of those, uh, you know, factors. Uh, the hand on the shoulder represents the religion because, you know, it's a hand and glove. It's supposed to be clean and, you know, uh, sacred, but, you know, they, they find their ways to use it as a, you know, tool to, you know, to suppress women. The one on the um, uh, wrist is uh, uh, that the ring finger is in the shape of uh, a scorpion's uh, tail is um, um, it's a symbol of um, uh, marriage and how women are being suppressed through marriage and economy and, uh, you know, um, financially. And the third hand is, uh, you know, the, the hands of uh, politician, you know, politics, you know, how they make rules for, you know, for women's bodies and, you know, um, for, you know, for us as women um, to also suppress us. And uh, there is a huge fingerprint because I use this piece um, as a social experiment. And this was because I saw how she received the backlashes, uh, backlashes from, uh, you know, uh, people instead of, you know, receiving support. So the piece was blocking uh, the um, uh, ground. So visitors had to decide whether they want to walk over this, uh, you know, uh, walk on the piece or uh, um, just just like, you know, walk over it. And um yeah, because uh, I used, again, this fingerprint uh, pen, uh, print, um, on the dress to just uh, show this that, you know, there, there's this perception that if you want to be an independent woman, if you want to choose, you know, what you want to be in the society, then they, uh, they believe that you are public property and they have the right to harass you or to, uh, you know, um, judge you. Yeah. I love this one. A few people in the comments are asking about specific inspirations for, for this. Um, people are asking about a David Bowie costume that has hands on it and uh, Louise Bourgeois. Were either of those references that you had in mind or are there other specific references you were thinking about with this work? Uh, I, I haven't seen their works to be honest. Um, yeah. So. 
this was, yeah. you know, based on this, this story that I shared. Right, absolutely. Um, so maybe we can go, Amy, to the photograph with the, the flower or the rose dress. Um, someone was asking about the types of fabrics and materials that were used for these pieces. So Rod, I don't know if you wanna say anything about um, where these fabrics were sourced or, or the specificity of them, yeah. Well, these fabrics, I, I would, there was a huge market in Kabul that they had the leftovers of, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, some of the brands. Uh, um, so the traders would just, you know, uh, bring all these leftovers from uh, China or Korea to Afghanistan. And you could find them like for a very cheap price. So usually I would go to buy the fabrics from that market. Um, because the quality was very good, but the prices were uh, were very reasonable, and I had you know a lot of options to you know to um, to find like you know the the kind of like right materials that I needed. Yeah, great. Okay, this is a huge question for both of you. Um, just feel free to answer whatever part of it you would like. So David Plumer asks, many of the changes to the museum system have occurred over the span of the last few years in response to factors such as COVID, further visibility of racism, world government turmoil, et cetera. What are some ways you feel the museum world has gotten better from these things? What are some places it's still lacking and things that could get better? Big question. The museum world? The museum world specifically. I guess you can talk about the art world in general if, if you'd like to. Hmm. The art world in general. In <laughs> or fun. Lori, I was also gonna ask you about how it's changed since you were younger and exhibiting work in the seventies, um, you know, in terms of access for women artists and so on. Uh, well, let me go back to to this yeah. question of uh, um, because I think that um, I feel that as as art and the art world and museums are all becoming more and more corporate by the day, <laughs> that it it is harder to um, make things that push against that, you know. So I I do. Um, mourn that about the art world is its um kind of uh, uh business aspect and it's it's i i sometimes walk into american museums and see corporate america so much in my face that mm -hmm. and nobody really pushing against that so much so this it, this is one of the things about rada's work that i love so much is is telling those kinds of stories and and here by the time it gets through the, the many filters of things, it, it often gets uh, somewhat, somewhat not, not somewhat, very diluted and, um, and has to kind of toe the line of, of what uh, the current uh, kind of um, politically correct thing to, to do and say is. And there are quite strict rules now for, for that. So I think that, that it becomes harder to make um, and, and show work that is uh, genuinely um, uh, uh, radical. Yeah, Rada, anything you wanna to add to that? Um, I, I don't think so. Yeah. So here's a question for you, Rada, from David Bragan. Um, he's asking whether you showed this work in Afghanistan, and maybe you could also talk about the the reception or the way people responded to it. Um, uh, actually, you know, uh, before the first uh, um, exhibition, I was a bit worried how people would receive it because um, it's a, you know it's a quite different way of you know using um, art. It's like kind of a modern art, and um, to my surprise, people, uh, you know, I have received a lot of positive feedbacks and I have received a lot of requests from people who, um, you know, some happened to come to the exhibition from, you know, uh, another province outside Kabul. And they were asking why I'm not exhibiting this, why I'm not, you know, giving a tour of this exhibition around the country. And um, 
I received even more support, more positive feedbacks on the second year of the exhibition. And um, um, yeah, I, you know, I, it was uh, it was a big surprise to me uh, that people people really uh, they would come to the exhibition. For instance, uh, for the second year, it was just right before the first lockdown. We had like um, over two thousand visitors just in two weeks. That's incredible. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm very excited to see whether you create a sort of mobile museum or online museum of this work. I think it would be fantastic. All right, here's another gigantic question from an anonymous viewer. Feel free to take this either one of you. Is it mainly men's fear of losing their power that prevents the progress of women becoming equal? <laughs> okay big one that's a big one <laughs> i think it's partly uh fear of losing power i think it's it's the it may be women's fear of taking power as well and what uh what that means and it's a uh, definitely um uh it's when you have something you don't generally willingly give it up which we learned very early in the women's movement, you can't just ask for it. They will say no. You have to take it. Uh, you have to take it. So what, whatever that means and whatever means you used to take it, um, it can be by showing what's going on <laughs> another way. Um, uh, unfortunately, uh, um, a, a forcible takeover is not in, uh, probably in the cards for uh, women, but um, I, I, so it's an incredibly complicated thing. And I just really appreciate it when um, it gradually dawns on people that uh, women have skills that are, are really valuable as human beings and that's very important to to use them we need all of that possible skills that we can muster at this point so it's it's a uh, really important to call on everyone to to um, add to this so yeah it's fear but um it's it's obviously uh um looks like anger sometimes, which is, I guess, just another outward expression of fear. Yeah. For just a little cheap psychology thrown into the mix. <laughs> I buy it. Um, so Chloe Billadeau is asking, I am a performance artist and I'm wondering how to talk about feminism without spoon feeding the audience. How do you go about being sneaky about politics? I love that. What is your tip on radicality? Um, humor. You can start with that. <laughs> it's like, it's always good to be funny. Um, and be, because, you know, you can't fake laughing. I mean, you, <laughs> yeah, you can sort of, <laughs> but you can't really, you know, it's physical and you can't help it. And so, uh, so, I mean, we work in a, in a, in a, in a mode that is, is partly rational, but but, but sensual. So, uh, our arguments are are on another level of sense arguments. And I mean, if I just wanted to express my opinions on feminism, I really wouldn't bother to use color or or notes or anything like that. That's the sneaky part. That's the sneaky part is coming into somebody's consciousness with so much. Let's say you could be could be beauty, we could go back to fear for a second. You can use fear, you can use all kinds of things when your tools are abstract, like color. And and I agree with you that it's it's um or with your with your I think um suggestion that it can be very, very obnoxious to just lecture people about what they should think. I, I think, you know, whenever people tell me what to think or do, I think you don't even know me. Don't tell me what to think with those words, you know, with those slogany things. So I think 
uh, you have a lot of tools if you're a performance artist to uh, to use that are the they are the sneaky tools and their their beauty and their humor and their um, uh, something that's just so staggering that you can't you know it just your your body can't reject it so you you laugh or you or you just kind of whoa that's you know so you can overwhelm I think that's your your ultimate weapon how about you Rada I, I sense you doing the same thing in your work um more and less yeah <laughs> Yeah, I think Lori talked about beauty as being a way to pull people in. Uh, and that's that's what I personally see in the work that you're making. So I'm going to ask one last question from the audience and then close. Um, this is for Rada from Daniel Medina. He says, Rada, have you considered utilizing men's clothes in your work? The rationale being that clothes transmit power, attitude, status, wealth, personality. Um, and he's, he's talking about also how Lori uses men's clothes in some of her work to uh, break down these kinds of gender barriers. Is that something you've considered? Uh, me, no, because, uh, you know, my goal for my work is women's history. So yeah. <laughs> I don't know how to fit men's clothes into the project. <laughs> so, uh, maybe once we, yeah, we uh, uh, Live the equal world, then we switch <laughs> to <laughs> men's clothing. That's very fair. What about Lori? Maybe you could talk just a little bit about kind of gender bending in some of your work, whether it's clothes or also your voice filter, and then we'll we'll close out. Oh well, uh, I I'm I yeah I began to use a, a, a <clears throat> filter that had a male voice, really just to. Uh, make fun of blowhards really you know <laughs> well, those of all, here's what i think you know everyone's like oh that's great that you think that so um you know and then that particular um thing got a little bit old and i and i and I'll, i also when you when you use someone else's voice you have a a deep affinity for them so I began to kind of love this guy this old blowhard guy and I and just thought oh uh, and his voice is coming out of me so I kind of like I was him and so I uh he his words became much more melancholy and and weird because I I began to like him so much I didn't want to just make fun of him I wanted to become him and see if I could understand him that way. So for me, it's an advanced kind of puppetry of just how do I, how do I understand? I mean, like most writers, I want to get inside somebody's head and, and see what, who they are, what they care about. Um, and, and, uh, try to, uh, to, to, yeah. Uh, feel who they are yeah otherwise it's just you know some kind of like me plastering some image on top of them so so it's a, for, so it's a way to um uh for me to engender empathy i suppose yeah great okay there's one last question sorry i lied before okay sharon Tupukio unrao asks to brilliant Lori and brave Rada, what do you consider your primary senses in the creative process and art making? What feeds your creative spirit today? So what are you looking at? What's getting you excited and feeding your creativity? Oh, Rada, do you? <laughs> well, but just today, uh, or I mean the last couple of days, uh, I think it's um, uh, bravery, and and I'm super inspired by like everybody else in the world by Zelensky, who uh, is in his bunker, and and he's uh, you know he, people are going we're we're gonna kill you, and he and and they say well how's it going, and he said well you know I have a wonderful life because I feel needed. And uh, this purpose of life to feel needed. Otherwise, I would just, what did he say? Otherwise, I'd just be an emptiness 
walking around breathing and eating something. <laughs> it's a strange list of things that humans do. But I thought, well, what a wonderful thing for a leader to say instead of spouting things about glory in Ukraine and country and the meaning of the world, the meaning of something. He said something very personal. And it was, I, I love my life, you know, <laughs> as it is. And so I think uh, for me, that in the middle of all of this is extremely inspiring. And I thought, well, I would like to be someone who can um, appreciate the, the potential of what is going on here because it, it is really, um, first of all, a, a, an opportunity to experience the fact that there is such enormous despair such enormous despair and suffering. And this is our world. And if we try to pretend that's not there, we're just really idiots. So I watched this guy and I'm like, that, that, is, that is just a wonderful way to be and, and to try to uh, find your place in the midst of, of a very, um, dangerously shifting uh, world that feels so full of cruelty right now. Thank you. Well, is there anything else either of you would like to add to close out? Prada, is there somewhere that viewers can follow your work or learn more if they would like? Uh, yeah, they can um, see my work on my website and uh, on, my, on my social media. Um, Mostly, I mostly use uh, Instagram, um, but I'm not very updated these days or since I have moved to <laughs> France. Um, uh, but uh, yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much both for being here with us tonight on International Women's Day. Yeah, um, thank you, Marina, it's like, and, and happy, happy International Women's Day, everybody, right? Yeah. <laughs> Um, also, a big thank you to Ewan and Genesee for their interpretation and captioning this evening, Amy to ma for managing the program. Um, big thank you to everyone who tuned in. And I just want to mention that our next event in this series is a talk with Lori and Mohammed El Garani, with whom she collaborated on a, a major artwork in our show called Habeas Corpus. Um, that will take place on May 3rd, and you can visit our website for more information. Um, also, I see that we put Rada's social media accounts in the chat, so please check those out. Uh, so that's it. Thank you, everyone, and see you next time. Bye, Marina. Bye, Rada. Bye-bye. Have a good night. Bye. Bye.